welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Sanchez from Community Relations here at Packard Children's Hospital and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in our series of uh, 20th anniversary uh, lectures celebrating the many innovations happening here at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital over the course of the last 20 years. And this evening, as you know, our topic is uh, I have a different topic from that. Innovations in Minimally Invasive Pediatric Surgery and Technology, presented by Dr. Sanjeev Dutta, who is Associate Professor of Surgery at Stanford School of Medicine and Surgical Director of the Multidisciplinary Initiative for Surgical Technology Research. Now, Dr. Dutta is the Arlene and Peter Harmon Endowment uh, endowed faculty professor and surgical director of the intestinal rehabilitation program here at LPCH. He's also director of the Stanford Surgical Skills Curriculum and he's the associate director of the Goodman Center for Simulation in Medicine at Stanford. His many research interests include his innovative work uh, in minimal access and scarless surgery for children. So it's my great pleasure to thank Dr. Dutta for the generous gift of his time and expertise this evening. And I'd like for you to join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjeev Dutta. Thanks, Dr. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Let me start by saying that um, it's really exciting that we're 20 years in, into things with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. I came here about six years ago, roughly. And, um, and I came from Canada, and um, I'd heard of Stanford, and I'd heard of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. But I came from an institution that was very old. It was much older than 20 years old. It was more like 120, maybe even 150 years old. Um, and so I had a very different perspective. We had this sort of hallowed halls of, the place is called uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and uh, this sort of, a lot of legacy, et cetera. And what immediately struck me about Stanford and Packard Children's Hospital was the enthusiasm and excitement for the future. While at, back at Sick Kids, we thought a lot about the past, and we, you know, and rightfully so, we celebrated it. Here, we spend a lot of our time thinking about the future. And that, I found, was really exciting and something that I wanted to be involved with, that I wanted to help take those risks and pave the way forward for children's health and, and uh, surgery in children. What I'm going to talk to you about today is um, a couple of things. One is some of the work I've done in uh, innovating, innovating pediatric surgery. And I'd also like to talk to you about some new ventures around technologies for uh, me uh, medical applications in children specifically. And the reason that I've sort of gone down this path wasn't necessarily by design like most things. It was sort of serendipity. And the reason it happened is I, um, I came to realize after the first couple of years of practice that I was, uh, I was becoming very uh, preoccupied with the, the, the disease aspect of what I do. And I think as physicians, we come, become very intrigued and interested and excited about the diseases we treat. And as a surgeon, you become excited about the operations you do and, and the technicalities of those operations and the clinical care. And what you forget sometimes is there's a patient there. Uh, and I suddenly started becoming very aware that the things I was doing wasn't just, I wasn't just doing an operation and fixing a problem. I was having an impact on these children that goes well beyond that. And, and thankfully some of that impact was really positive, but as you can imagine, there's some real negative impacts. So I was making big scars. I was uh, hospitalizing them for extended periods of time. And that was having a psychological impact on them. And, um, and what I came to realize is there's all this collateral damage of what I did as a surgeon in my effort to help kids. And I needed to focus on some of that as well. And so the goal of all this stuff is very simply to minimize the collateral damage of the work I do so that I can be more effective as a surgeon. So that's it. Good night. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. No, uh, so, let me tell you about what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to speed up at times because there's certain things I want to make sure you see. And I'll slow down for those things. I want to talk to you about what is the evolution of minimal access surgery in children. And I'm going to explain to you why minimally invasive surgery was the term that was being used by Nancy and why I used the term minimal access. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about sort of a concept that I've, 
I wouldn't say that I, I created it because like most things, there are people from all over the place that come together. But I, I did sort of defi define this term of stealth surgery uh, to encompass a certain way of thinking about your patient. I'm going to give you some examples of stealth surgery. If I get a chance, I'm going to show you a movie. And uh, nothing like the Oscars. And the critical <laughs> role of novel technologies. I'm going to get into that a bit. So let me start by saying that uh, what I'm talking about is by no means, so that's that last line down there, is by no means the limits of what innovations are occurring in pediatric surgery right now. There are innovations in transplantation, there's innovations in tissue engineering and stem cell research, in uh, you know, image guided therapy, radiation therapies, that's what CyberKnife is, it's a way to do operations without making any incisions uh, using radiation um, energy. Um, I'm only talking about one part of this, and, uh, and I'm not particularly good with test tubes or physics and things like that, so what I'm talking about is what I am very passionate about and what maybe I'm a little, I'm pretty good at, and uh, that's why I chose this area as a focus of my research and academic uh, endeavors. So minimal access surgery is not minimally invasive surgery. I'm still really doing a very invasive operation. It's as invasive as it always was, even through a big incision except that I'm doing it through very small access points so that I can almost uh, not leave any evidence that I was there. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit more in detail in a while. So I do the minimal access and I try to minimize the collateral damage, the damage I told you about, uh, while still doing maximally invasive procedures. <clears throat> also, I think that the, that the role of surgeon is changing. There was a time where we had, well, there still is a time where we have surgeon, an endoscopist, that's somebody who takes long camera tubes and puts them down your mouth and other areas. And we had uh, radiologists, okay? And all of us would, will work together to provide uh, care to the patient. And I really believe in the next 10 years, I'm hoping sooner than that, but probably in the next decade, we're going to have one practitioner that tries to do all those things. We're starting to see some, some hints of that. The problem is then you spend 25 years training and you're ready to retire before before you can start working, but um, I'd, what I'd like to see is a surgeon trained in endoscopy, trained in image guidance, so that they can bring all those talents together uh, holistically to the patient. I'm going to talk to you about the evolution of minimal access surgery. So it sort of started uh, in the early 80s when we started realizing that, well, when we make big incisions, that's quite traumatic to the patient. And well, what if we can use these new technologies of cameras and special chopstick-like instruments and poke holes into the belly or the chest and, and then use the camera to look inside? And, and it was not embraced with open arms. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism and a lot of caution, uh, rightfully so. But we were eventually able to get to a place where we could get our big incisions to small scars. So that was the first step. Um, so the, one of the places that we, and I, and I uh, apologize ahead of time if I shock people with some of the images I had, but um, Nancy told me and, uh, that, um, you know, that, that you wanted to see that, so here they are. Um, hopefully you, this, uh, this projects okay. So a hernia in a child, essentially what it is, is, um, let, me, let me get my laser pointer here, is there is, uh, here's your intestines in your belly, you get a little hole up here and intestine can get down through the hole. That's a congenital hole. Everyone develops with it and it should close up. The intestine goes down into the scrotum, as you can imagine, and the baby gets a really big scrotum because it's full of intestine. Now, the, the fathers always claim that they're not surprised by the size of the scrotum, that this is, you know, what, what do you mean? There's nothing wrong here. But, there, but actually, what's happened is that all that intestine's gone down to the scrotum. And what we used to do is make incisions in the groin on both sides, and we would, um, we would repair those hernias, putting at risk some certain structures, uh, such as the vas deferens and the testicular vessels, which are extremely important because they supply the testicle and they let the, the sperm travel, and of course, fertility is dependent on that. So at this institution, we were the first to widely adopt a new technique of doing this, where, and we actually reported our experience back a couple of years ago, where we actually, and I'm not sure this projects well, but this is looking from the inside, and this is the hole that, that you'd see on the inside that allows that intestine to go through. We put a little telescope in the, in the belly button, which is a scar, so you go through the old scar, 
And um, under visualization, we make a tiny two millimeter incision and we can pass a little a stitch right around that hole, tie it up. We don't touch the vas and vessels, so we don't damage the testicle. And this operation now takes us for one side on, on, a, on a boy about eight minutes. So it's very, very fast and virtually pain-free. The babies, um, we believe, have no pain at all, except for maybe a dose of Tylenol after the operation. And the older kids are in a little bit of discomfort for about 12 hours. So it's a very uh, effective operation. Well, that got me kind of excited to, to start doing this and see the impact that this could have. And I started thinking about other places that we've used minimal access surgery. So chest surgery is another area where we make uh, we used to make, and in some cases still do, make a big incision that's the front of the child, that's the back of the child. That's called a posterolateral thoracotomy. And that's how we access the chest cavity to do lung resections or get at the esophagus or the, or the airways. The trouble with that is you do that in a baby, which we often have to do, and you end up with chest wall deformities later in life. And these children can develop scoliosis hunched over. They can get something called a winged scapula, and that comes from cutting the nerve that supplies a special muscle on the chest wall that keeps your scapula in place. And if it's damaged, then that scapula flares out. So they have significant problems with that. We now have enough technology and experience that we can now, once again, use these uh, chopstick-like instruments. We can uh, use cameras. And we have the skill, dexterity, and the train appropriate training to now remove masses in the chest, in, inside the chest, as you see here, and just use three little puncture points like that. We've basically eliminated the pain of a thoracotomy, which is significant, and we've eliminated any chances of having chest wall uh, deformities later in life. We can also do this for uh, lung resection. So this is an example up here of an abnormal part of the lung that this child is born with. Uh, these are big blood vessels uh, serving that part of the lung, and we have special devices that can just seal the artery. Uh, we don't have to tie it or clip it or anything. We just apply those devices. They seal the artery using a special type of heat, and uh, we can remove that entire piece of lung. There's the perception out there that, well, how can you do these operations through a long, thin rod lens? Isn't it like looking through a straw? And actually, I would say it's quite the opposite. In fact, it's so much the opposite that there's difficulty in understanding and assimilating the information you get when you first do this, and that's the challenge. You get too much information, and here you can see this area that we're looking at. <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me just tell you that this instrument is three millimeters in diameter. So this area that we're looking at is inside the chest of this baby. We've gone through three port sites here, and it represents about one inch square of the inside of the chest cavity. And this child has an abnormality of the esophagus that uh, people said could never, ever be done thoracoscopically, meaning using minimal access instruments and stab incisions. And we now routinely do this. In fact, just last in the last month, I think we've done three or four of these. Um, these children uh, are very well uh, served by this operation, and uh, we once again avoid all that sequela. In fact, this is the child of, a, of one of the plastic surgery residents that was formerly here who uh, sadly had this condition, but we were able to fix it. Those are the, those are the scars, and um, that's the, the study, the contrast study when we do showing that the esophagus looks ex essentially normal. So, um, so chest surgery is, I think, a major advancement, and I believe that pediatric surgeons actually led the way in doing chest surgery in a minimal access way compared to adult surgeons. <clears throat> now, the liver is a different beast. The liver, think of the liver as a giant bag of bile and blood. So cutting the liver is not necessarily something you want to do uh, in a haphazard way, and for that reason, many surgeons still do this very large incision in the abdo abdomen to get at the liver. And this is what it looks like, you know. So you've got a pretty sizable scar, as you can see. <coughs> um, not to mention a considerable amount of pain, because that incision, it, it splints. And uh, every time you breathe in, it, it, uh, it uh, gives you pain with the, to have the subcostal incision like that. Now, here's a tumor that had I shown it to surgeons even, I would say, 10 years ago. This, this is the tumor right here, and that's the, the normal liver. So you can see that the tumor extends right down into the pelvis. This is a CT scan. And this is another CT scan 
uh, showing crosscuts, and you can see that it's about seven by 11 millimeters, which is pretty big because this child, I think, was around three or four years old. So, the, um, <clears throat> so this is a very large tumor, and had I shown it to a surgeon 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, they would have laughed me out of the operating room and said, there's no way you're going to get this out using a laparoscopic technique. And, uh, and my answer to that surgeon was, well, we need the technologies to do that. So it's true. Ten years ago, I couldn't have done it. But now what do we have? We have um, <clears throat> ultrasound that we can, that comes in long sticks now. So we can put the ultrasound into the belly. And uh, normally when we do liver surgery, we feel with our fingers to see where the tumor is. Well, now the ultrasound is our fingers because I can look on the ultrasound screen and I can see where the tumor is and where it isn't. I can also, um, that's me using the ultrasound here, I can also use something called a hydrojet dissector that didn't exist 10 years ago. And what that does is it takes a, a high stream, and the engineers will appreciate this, a high stream jet of water to use to cut. And if you set the stream at the right pressure, you will cut the liver tissue, but you won't cut the blood vessels and the, and the bile ducts and all that. And so I can go and go right through it, and all the blood vessels will skeletonize, and I can see them. And that's what's happened right here. This is a branch of the portal vein. Uh, portal vein bleeding is a very significant cause of bleeding in liver surgery and can sometimes result in death. This was essentially a bloodless operation where we cut the liver part of it, we find the vein, and I use this device I told you about called a ligature, uh, which is uh, basically a, a bipolar device that clamps down on the vessel. It, it uh, creates some energy, it does some thermal sealing, and there's an algorithm that does a feedback loop and tells you exactly when the seal is, is fixed, and you let it go, and now you've got basically uh, a cut vessel with sealed ends that, that, that are, are good to about three or four times systemic pressure. <clears throat> so this kid, unfortunately, had a tumor that was uncertain of whether it was benign or malignant. It turned out to be benign, thankfully. And so what I did is instead of removing it through, this is the head up here, instead of removing it through this subcostal incision, which we would have done, I made, this is the sort of incision you would see with a C-section. It's much less painful, although, just so I don't offend the ladies, it's still kind of painful, but um, it's much less painful than this incision. And that's the tumor, that's a two-inch incision, and we removed it that way, and thankfully it was um, a benign tumor. <clears throat> so why go to all this trouble? I mentioned culture, and I mentioned how, as surgeons, we get caught up in these diseases that we treat, and we sometimes forget the patient. Um, in fact, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we have this sort of Calvinist culture in what we do, and for us, or for many surgeons, it's like, well, you know, yeah, there was a scar and there's a wound, but suck it up. At least we took care of the problem. You know, you'll live, it'll make you stronger to have this. You know, unfortunately, the data is not supporting that. that that the children that we leave scars on don't actually go, hey man, I'm really proud of my scar and this is gonna make me a stronger person. In fact, it can have some very negative effects in most children on their socialization, whether they verbalize it or not. So what kind of negative effects? Well, the, now there are actual studies to show poor school performance, um, poor socialization, less likely to make friends. They have reduced self-esteem. And, um, and one interesting thing is when they asked children without scars what they thought of kids with scars, they were less likely to be their friend. They don't want to be their friend. Everybody wants friends, right? Um, so this is still sort of burning away at me. I'm like, well, you know, sure, we make small scars, but hey, what if, you know, what if um, these scars are, are, are even, if, even though they're small, what if it still bothers these, you know, these kids? I mean, just the fact that having a scar itself is, in a way, a stigmatizing experience. Is that possible? I think it's possible. And so that was sort of bothering me a bit. And, um, and so that's why I, I thought, well, why, what if we could hide the scars? Okay, now, now we make small scars, and what a great thing that we did. We went from big, huge subcostal incisions to tiny little, you know, one, one centimeter incisions or five millimeter incisions. Um, what if we could hide the scars? And uh, I think I'm going to have trouble with the next slide, but no, I'm not. I'm good. This is what I see when I look in the mirror every morning. Um, and so I, I thought, you know what? Like, we do all this stealth stuff, right? Why can't we do stealth surgery? And that's what stealth surgery is about. It's about performing complex operations without leaving evidence that they occurred in an effort to minimize the collateral damage of surgery. So that's my mission if I were 
this soldier, my mission is to minimize the collateral damage of what I do. And, and one of the first places that we started doing that, we actually borrowed from the plastic surgery literature. Okay? Um, plastic surgeons do brow lifts, right? Get rid of your wrinkles, and that's, what's, that's what you see there. And some pretty good plastic surgeons will do that by making incisions in the scalp and then tunneling underneath the skin and tightening up the muscles. That's called an endoscopic brow lift. Well, gosh, if we're going to spend all this effort and energy into endoscopic brow lifts, why can't we spend that kind of effort removing lesions, clearly stigmatizing lesions from the foreheads of children? That was the thought. And you can see this little tumor here. This is called a dermoid cyst. It's a benign tumor, but you know it's benign in the sense that it's not going to spread anywhere, but it's certainly not benign in the way it looks. right? Um, and so we had uh, Peter Lawrence. He's uh, one of our plastic surgeons. And I invited Peter to come over and say, Peter, show us how you do this brow lift stuff. And, but let's, not, let's do something different. Let's, let's remove one of these lesions. And that's exactly what we did. Um, this is an example of a lateral brow dermoid. And this is an ex a more severe example. You can see the lump right there. That's called a nasoglobellar dermoid cyst. And that's a rare variant. But the trouble with that one is this smack right here. So, and uh, if you go to remove it, you're going to make an incision right between the brows. There's no good way to hide that incision. You can't hide it. In the, bra in the lateral brow, people try to hide it in just on top of the eyebrow there. But here, you can't hide it. And what have I basically done? I've taken one deformity and replaced it with another deformity. So I've really done no good for this child. Not only that, but this, this was a, an adolescent female. And she had, uh, you know, as most adolescent females, had acne. And if I make an incision there, it has about an 80% chance of getting infected. And infected incis incisions don't heal. So it's a catch-22. So I took uh, Peter's uh, brow lift stuff. That's it right there. Nothing too fancy. And, uh, and once again, I'm sorry to shock you with some of these images. But this is the incision uh, above the hairline. You can see one here. And we're just looking inside and tunneling down to the, um, tunneling down to the, um, to the lesion. And then we can use some instruments. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. Right there, you can see a second instrument going in there. And it's doing um, all the dissection. The inside looks something like this. There's the lump. OK, and there's, uh, you can't really see it here, the instrument tip. That's a two millimeter, or, uh, sorry, three millimeter instrument. And once it's all removed, the lump's gone. Um, and kids are happier. So this is the boy with the, the brow dermoid. Uh, as it turned out, this, this uh, little boy was, uh, had a very active modeling career. And the parents were delighted that he didn't have a scar on his face for that reason. And this girl, as you can see, no scar, nothing to see. It's up in the hairline, uh, and it will hopefully never be visible. <clears throat> well, if you can go through the scalp okay, to get at stuff in the forehead, where else can you go? What else can you do? So I started thinking about that. And in particular, I was thinking about the neck. And I don't know if you know anybody, or maybe perhaps you yourself have a neck scar. Neck scars, as, as much as you try, you, you tend to to look at them. When you meet somebody with a neck scar, your eyes will go, go to the neck scar initially. And so they're particularly stigmatizing. And in some cultures, such as a Korean culture, it's a, a very stigmatizing, uh, almost considered sort of a sign of bad luck. So you want to avoid neck scars if you can. Now, where are scars? Uh, where can you put a scar that's not so stigmatizing? And I thought, and I thought, where could I put a scar? Finally, I decided the armpit was the best place to put the scar, because no one ever looks at your armpit, hopefully. And, uh, and, you know, and it's basically your arms are down, and you're covered, and they tend to be covered with clothing. But how do you, if you put a scar on your armpit, how do you get yourself to a place to do um, you know, the neck surgery? So I'm going to show you a little video here on how we do that. The goal of stealth surgery is to perform an operation without leaving any evidence that an operation occurred. Developed at Packard Children's Hospital, transaxillary subcutaneous endoscopic surgery is one example of stealth surgery. Operations for lesions in the neck are a good candidate for this approach because normally they leave quite visible scar on the neck. The approach involves making some small incisions in the axilla into which endoscopic ports are placed. These ports tunnel under the skin and a workspace is created superficial to pectoralis fascia to allow access to the neck. The initial part of this operation involves developing this workspace, and it is important to spend a good amount of time developing a very wide and cavernous workspace so as to have ease of movement 
of all the instruments. This is the skin up here, and this is the chest insulation muscle. Insulation gas is used to assist development of the workspace, and the non-vascular attachments are taken down using hook electrocautery. The generous workspace is visually apparent on the outside of the patient. Typically, two to three ports are used. The first case at our institution using this approach was in a nine-year-old male with congenital torticollis. He presented with a permanent deformity and hemihypoplasia of the face. The video depicts an identical procedure in a patient with left-sided torticollis. After achieving the workspace, the sternocleidomastoid was identified and the sternal head was isolated. Using hook electrocautery, the sternal head of the sternocleidomastoid was then divided at its lower third. Here the fibrotic nature of the muscle can be visualized and there is absolutely no bleeding upon division of the muscle. During division of the sternal head, it is important to avoid any injury to the internal jugular vein that sits just posterior to this area. Frequent finger palpation on the outside surface allows the surgeon to landmark abnormal anatomy and also navigate the normal anatomy. This is the muscle that's in your neck right here. Everybody can feel it. It's if important want. to extend this dissection to the contracted bands of the cervical fascia. Once again, these can be identified through external palpation and direct visualization. With the sternal head divided, the less involved clavicular head is then also divided in a similar fashion. The clavicular head tends to sit posterior and lateral to the sternal head. This child had excellent range of motion postoperatively, with well-hidden incisions in the axilla and no incisions on the neck. Three such procedures have been performed with mean operative time of 50 minutes. The next patient was a two-year-old male who had a very obvious, visible, dilated vein at the base of the left neck. Once again, transaxillary subcutaneous access was obtained and the vein identified. Careful dissection showed the vein to cross in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. A 5 mm ligature radiofrequency vessel sealing device was used to transect the vein. The vein was first transected laterally. This was done using two applications of the ligature device to ensure hemostasis. The vein was then carefully dissected free to its junction with the internal jugular vein on that side. The vein could clearly be seen distending with respiration. The vein was then transected using the ligature device at its junction with the internal jugular vein. Metzenbaum scissors were then used to cut the vein free. The next procedure involved a three-year-old female who had an obvious thyroglossal duct cyst. Because of the upper midline nature of this lesion, it was decided that it would be better to triangulate instruments through each axilla and place a camera in the midline between the nipples. This one small midline incision could easily be hidden with clothing. That First, a workspace was, was the, created uh, the, up the, into the, the neck. On the inside. Marking the area of the lesion preoperatively using a felt marker on the skin helped to landmark the lesion intraoperatively. Once again, transcutaneous finger palpation was useful to help identify the lesion. With the lesion identified from the subcutaneous space, a small defect was created in the platysma muscle to actually access the lesion itself. The cyst was immediately identified and then carefully dissected from the surrounding tissues. This was done using a combination of blunt dissection as well as hook electrocautery. It is important during removal of a thyroglossal duct cyst that one also remove the hyoid bone through which the duct migrates. Failure to do so results in recurrence. Here, hook electrocautery is used to carefully dissect away the strap muscles that attach onto the hyoid bone. The cyst itself is seen superiorly. With the hyoid bone delineated and cleared of attachments, the hook scissors are then used to transect the bony portion. 
Here we see the thyroglossal duct, including the hyoid bone and cyst, emanating from the base of the pharynx near the foramen cecum. The excellent visualization allows full dissection. An endoloop device is then introduced into the area and securely tied around the base of the duct. Here the cyst is detached from the duct and the hyoid bone is shaved off from the base of the duct using hook scissors. In this way a complete dissection of the cyst and duct are achieved. There's going to be a test on this later by the and way. And the specimens are carefully removed through one of the ports. The final patient is a 13-year-old male diabetic who presented with hypercalcemia. Parathyroid hormone levels were elevated and imaging identified a right lower parathyroid adenoma. A three-port approach through the right axilla was used and intraoperative ultrasound was utilized to identify the lesion. Dissection was carried between the heads of the sternocleidomastoid. The muscle superiorly is the right sternal head and the inferior muscle is the right clavicular head. As with the previous operations, note how adherence to the tissue planes allows for dissection through generally avascular connective tissue. Once again, a wide working space is created so as not to have to work through a tunnel. <clears throat> with the region between the heads of the sternocleidomastoid cleared, we can now identify the carotid sheath. In this image, the carotid artery is seen clearly and the strap muscles are just anterior to this area. That's the carotid artery. We now artery. approach the lateral inferior aspect of the thyroid and the inferior thyroid vein on the right side is clearly identified and dissected. Once the vein is isolated, hook electrocautery is used to carefully dissect across the vein. This gives excellent access to the right lower pole of the thyroid gland. By retracting the thyroid gland anteriorly, we can start to identify the area of the parathyroid adenoma. The intraoperative ultrasound also helps in achieving this. For ultrasound to work effectively, the carbon dioxide gas has to be removed. Once the <coughs> adenoma is identified, the connective tissues around it are carefully dissected away. There's a small yellowish area of fat that helps to identify the parathyroid. With the adenoma clearly identified, it is dissected away from surrounding tissues and the vascular pedicle is divided using hook electrocautery. With the adenoma completely freed, it is removed from the area of dissection. Intraoperative parathormone assay showed a sudden decrease in parathyroid hormone consistent with the removal of the adenoma. The adenoma was placed in the finger of a surgical glove and removed through one of the port sites. Here is the post-operative appearance of this patient. The carbon dioxide gas used for insufflation is quickly resorbed and there is no post-operative bruising. All patients, including this one, were discharged home the same day and required only acetaminophen for pain control. So there was a lot of technical terms in there, and I apologize for that. That was presented at the American College of Surgeons meeting. Um, but I thought it would give you a good idea of what, you know, what the actual mechanics of this is. Um, and because I played the video, I'm going to have some redundant slides, so I'm just going to go through it. I will mention, though, that this child that had the ectopic vein, it was a vein on the neck. And every time he would breathe in or cry, it would blow up like a balloon. Uh, it was very unusual looking, and what was interesting, uh, they were from Russia, and the mom had the exact same thing as a child, and she had it removed, and she had this sort of Frankenstein scar with hatch marks on her neck that she wanted to avoid um, for her own child. So uh, I was, that was really um, fulfilling to, to be able to help her with that. This, this is the child that had the torticollis. He was nine years old. He came from Mexico. Uh, and uh, didn't have any health care down there, and uh, for that reason was permanently disfigured. The problem with this, pro uh, this uh, tightness of the muscle can cause disfigurement of the skull as well, long term, so it's important to fix this problem. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, it was great to see him hold his head up again, um, and uh, I just love that, uh, I think, let me see if I can find that. I don't have that picture, but I just love that picture where he's standing with me. It's one of my favorite pictures, but it always gets me in trouble at the airport. 
Um, so this is, um, this is a girl who had a giant lipoma. Lipoma is a fatty tumor, okay? And um, this is a benign tumor. It, it, it's not malignant in the sense that it doesn't spread anywhere, but it's extremely disfiguring. And in fact, this girl, she was 15 years old, and she had, almost looked like she had a humpback. Um, and to remove that would require about a 10 centimeter, at least a 10 centimeter, if not bigger, incision. So we used some other technology. We used a surgical robot, and we brought that. And because of the size of the lesion, I couldn't physically get around it with the instruments I have. And we used a surgical robot to get around the tumor, and then we pulled it out of a one, one inch incision in the axilla. <clears throat> so, um, so those are the sort of, um, sort of things that, um, that um, we've been doing through the axilla. Now, fine, so I'm never happy, right? My wife will tell you that. And, um, and I wanted to have no scars at all. Well, that's not technically all that easy to do, is it? But there are some little tricks you can use, much like Harry Houdini, um, that can make it look like that you have no scars. And so I started exploring that idea. We have, um, we have a scar on our body that's a very important scar. We don't think much of it. We kind of make fun of it sometimes. And we definitely poke it in our toddlers, because I always do that to my toddler. It's the belly button. Okay, and uh, the belly button is actually the place where the umbilical cord used to attach, obviously. And, it, and once the umbilical cord falls off, it becomes a scar. But the great thing about scars is if you put an incision in a scar, you still end up with a scar, right? So, uh, so the sum is, is, is basically that it looks the same as it looked when you started. And that was the idea when I met this little guy, who got a lot of press, by the way. That's why he's got this professional picture up here. But this is uh, Ryan, and Ryan had a condition called hereditary spherocytosis. Hereditary spherocytosis is a condition where the spleen, uh, sorry, the blood vessels are abnormal, and for that reason, the spleen, trying to be the good warden of the body, starts destroying all the, all the, all the um, I'm sorry, I said blood vessels, I meant blood cells. The blood cells are abnormal, and the spleen destroys the blood cells. In so doing, it makes the child anemic, and it also becomes, the, the spleen ends up becoming quite enlarged. So how do you fix that? Well, you can't give them new blood, at least not yet, although that may come in time. But you can remove the spleen, and that really helps these kids. The trouble is, when we were removing spleens 20, 15, 20 years ago, we were doing it through an incision like this. And then we started doing laparoscopic surgery. But then it became like this, five or six, uh, sometimes six ports. This one's five ports. We've got three surgeons. I mean, this looked like a real party here, right, with all these incisions, et cetera. And so even some people who were not very experienced in laparoscopy said, well, what if we could at least maybe get one hand in there? So they came up with something called a hand port, which I think is the goofiest concept on the planet. But anyway, you, you, you put this giant port and you put your hand in, and then you use laparoscopy. I'm like, gosh, we got to stop doing this stuff. We must be able to do this in a sneakier way, you know, a stealth way. Thankfully, the belly button uh, made itself apparent, and you can now get some devices and instruments in just through the belly button alone. So this is the abdominal wall, this is the umbilicus, and look at these fancy instruments. They allow me to bend at the end. Have you ever tried washing the dishes like this? It doesn't work, right? You have to triangulate around the dishes, right? Much like that, you have to triangulate around the tissues when you operate. And if you have instruments co-located, if they're going through the same, essentially the same hole, you can't get that. They're next to each other, and you can't operate. So these instruments allow me to triangulate. That's sort of the, the basic way of saying it. And so what I do is I cross the shafts, and then the wrists come back, right? And now I can work like this. Now, this is actually surprisingly, although it looks a lot like laparoscopic surgery, it's actually quite a bit different. It requires a whole new type of skill set. But with some practice, uh, it comes. And um, in fact, you don't even have to use those special ports. Here, I'm just using regular ports and kind of shoving them all through the same incision. And that's what we did. We removed um, the spleen using what uh, this is called single incision laparoscopic surgery. And, uh, and Ryan was a star, and he's showing off. That's his, there's no scar there, really. You, can, you can't really tell. But the belly button, there, is an, there was an incision there. And uh, this is just an example. I don't know how well it's projecting. Is it, can you see that? Kind of. This is an example of a gallbladder removal, and the point is that if you look at the, if you look at the instruments, which you can kind of see, one's coming from over here, and the one you can't really see is coming from right here, but those instruments are going into the belly like this, 
like straight next to each other. But in, in the inside, it looks like you're doing it as you would normal with the standard laparoscopy. So these are here's just more belly button scars. That's all it is. And just to show you that it basically looks like a normal umbilicus. So these we've removed spleens and gallbladders and appendixes and uh, you name it, done fundoplications, which is for uh, reflux disease. But the really cool thing, this is the latest, okay, no one's heard this yet. It's not even in the literature, but one of the things we figured out, and I always learn from my colleagues when I'm watching other people, right? And so I'm always sort of watching the anesthesiologist. They don't know it, but I'm kind of stealing ideas from them. And one of the things that they do is something called a tap block. And uh, that means transversus abdominis plane block. And that's just big fancy words. All they're saying is they're taking some local anesthetic and they get really sophisticated, right? Because this is their procedure. So they get out the ultrasound and they put the gloves on and the mask and everything. And they put the ultrasound on the abdominal wall. And me and my colleagues always have a good laugh over it. And then they take the needle and they slowly advance it. And this is actually pretty cool. And so I don't mean to belittle them because they act, this is a great idea. What they do is they pass the needle under ultrasound guidance and the needle goes into the plane between the transversus abdominis muscle and the internal oblique muscle probably doesn't mean a lot to you, except that at a certain level of your abdomen, all the nerves, all the sensory nerves to the abdominal wall go through that one area, right? So <clears throat> why is that important? Well, what have, what have I done? I've taken the one, I've taken all these incisions, five or six incisions all over the abdominal wall, and I've put them at the belly button, right? Now, if I could just cut the nerves away, or not cut them, but block the nerves to the belly button, then there's no pain. And that was, the, that was the hypothesis. And so what we did is uh, very recently we, first of all, we got rid of the ultrasound because that's a waste of time. We had our laparoscope on the inside. We could see perfectly where the needle was. And, we, and, we, and all these patients, we started to inject local anesthetic on both sides that lasts for about 15 hours or sometimes a bit longer. And what we found is an operation that had a mean hospital stay of about three days now they go home the next morning. So this is exciting. Very exciting because think of the money you save to the healthcare system by getting people home that early. And the trauma of being hospitalized is much reduced. So this is exciting. I haven't, uh, so you heard it here first. We'll see what happens. It may not be a big seller. Um, and finally, let me just touch on uh, natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. <coughs> Our notes, you probably hear about this in the media. Um, this is referring to the idea that you can go through the mouth or you know, other places that we have and you can find uh, your way into the uh, abdomen cavity or the chest cavity by going through the walls of the intestinal tract. That's, that's what notes means. And I think it's, it's a compelling concept and I think we still haven't figured out where it really plays a role because uh, uh, it's sort of a long run for a short slide it seems, but especially when we can do things like transumbilical surgery. However, it is intriguing because there are some problems, for example, in children that may be very well suited to that. But doing operations through the, uh, through the mouth is actually a really interesting idea. We do a big operation called an isenfundoplication, which takes the stomach and wraps it around the esophagus, and it's for heartburn. It's for severe heartburn. Um, there's a device out there now uh, called the esophix. It goes through the mouth and basically using a very complex uh, mechanism, it creates a sort of a fundoplication inside the stomach so that you don't have to go through the abdominal wall. That's, we've done that in kids here, but uh, they have to be relatively large, so we haven't done a lot of them. In babies, though, they can be born with something called esophageal atresia, and I think this is really where notes makes a lot of sense. Esophageal atresia is a condition where the esophagus, the swallowing tube that goes into the stomach, doesn't form completely, and it's got a big gap. And right now, and I think I showed you a picture of that where, we, where I had, uh, when I was talking about what great visualization you get with a scope, that was the type of problem that I was talking about. Right now, we go through the chest, either with laparoscopic instruments or with a, through a big incision, and we connect those two parts together. But I believe that we can eventually do that operation entirely through the mouth. And in fact, we're working on a, a prototype that I'm going to show you a quick picture of that, um, that uh, tr attempts to fix that problem. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. So gastros this is a kind of a shocking picture as well. Babies can be born with a condition called gastroschisis uh, that uh, basically means there's a, a defect on the abdominal wall and all the intestines 
come out, which is a lethal condition. And the first person to, um, to fix this problem uh, was this guy named Fear, actually, quite an appropriate name, Fear. And uh, he, he uh, in 1878, he was encountered by this. He didn't know what to do. He hadn't seen one. And what he did instead is he took the intestine and he put it back into the belly through the hole, very gingerly, of course, and then took the umbilical cord and just kind of put it over the hole so you don't have to look at it anymore and put, took a little silk suture and tied the umbilical cord down and said, well, you know, if the baby survives, then great. And if not, and, and you know, it was, this was like 100% mortality back in the late 1800s. I mean, people just died from this. Kids just died from this. This is just an old specimen of, of one of those kids that would have died from it. Um, and lo and behold, the thing worked, okay? And then after that, no one did it again until about 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, uh, we rediscovered this method. And the only reason I bring this up is that sometimes innovation comes from looking to the past, right? People have thought some cool things, and we now uh, we can learn from this uh, Dr. Fear. Now, what, what have we been doing all these years if we weren't doing that? And what we've been doing is, because we have anesthetic and operating rooms, we take the children to the operating room and we close up that scar. But look, we don't do such a great job, do we? We close up that wound. We put the bowel back in, we put stitches, and we close up that wound. And so when I came here about six years ago, I said, well, why don't we try this passive, you know, still surgical management, but this sort of more passive way of doing it. And here's an example of that, where there's the hole, that's the umbilical cord kind of coiled up in that hole, and it's got a big plastic dressing on it. And we kind of put that plastic dressing on, and then we tell everybody not to look for five or six days. And, uh, and sometimes the baby's born with a lot of intestine out. We can't put it back into the abdomen. We put a bag. This is really technical, right? We put a bag on it. That's the best thing we could come up with. And then we took the bag on it, and then we squeezed the bag down like toothpaste. And once it's all in, then we kind of pop the bag off and really quickly put the dressing on, and we don't look for five days. And this is what we get after a year. Um, and it's really remarkable. Most of these kids, you can't tell that they had anything wrong with them. So let's just face it, the body knows how to heal itself, it just needs help. Let me tell you that um, doing some of these things, um, people sometimes ask, well, how do you just, how can you just try something new on somebody? And it's not like I wake up in the morning and over breakfast I go, hey, I'm gonna try this today. <laughs> and I run in and I find the first patient. It's, this is through thought, it's through successive successes, meaning that we do baby steps, we're successful and we push a little bit further. It, has, it involves a lot of collateral expertise um, in terms of um, having, I have a lot of lap, laparoscopic experience in the chest before I do something that hasn't been done before in the chest. Um, and so I have I've accumulated a lot of experience and I use technologies that are tried and tested. Speaking of technologies, this guy was my hero when I was growing up, some of you probably know him. Uh, this is Doc Bones from Star Trek, and what I loved about Bones is he had that little device. You remember the device? And you just kind of, somebody would get sick, and you just take it over and go beep, 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 like that on top of them, and they'd be better. And I go, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Of course, I'd be out of a job, but wouldn't it be great? And so that's what got me into the idea of how do I, um, how do I make new devices and how do I innovate in the field of surgery? So there is a problem, though, because I have all these ideas. You know, I kind of know what I want, and I kind of have an idea of what it should look like. So, and I have a, a, an insight into the problem, but I don't have the technical know-how. The engineers, they have a lot of technical know-how, but they haven't got a clue what they should be making. And so together, it's like a match made in heaven. There's a difficulty in communication. They speak a different language than I do. And it took me a long, I'm still learning it, but it's taken me a long time to kind of learn how to communicate with engineers and, and see into their world. But what I have learned is early collaborative teamwork is essential to the device design process. And that if you delay this interaction, which all too, happen, all too often happens, uh, somebody very bright engineer makes a device works on it for three years and then talks to a doc. That's the wrong thing to do because delayed interaction will lead to confusion. They gotta understand the clinical context and the clinical algorithm. And this is, in the terms of technology development, I think this is the most important thing, most important message is you, making cool stuff isn't enough because you can make a really cool device and the doctor has absolutely no use for it because it doesn't impact the clinical uh, pathway. It's very, very important to understand the clinical pathway, and you need docs involved for that reason. Um, 
for this reason uh, and this interest, I got to know one of the engineers at SRI International. SRI is formerly Stanford Research Institute, and then in the 70s spun off uh, under, as their own SRI International. It's in Menlo Park. And uh, Pablo Garcia and I just started talking about this, and, uh, and as most things, like Hewlett and Packard, a friendship emerged, and from that friendship emerged a, uh, a, a, I think, a great driving force in pediatric devices. We wanted to create a skunk works. Skunk works is an old term that Lockheed Martin used for their research uh, institute, which was unhindered. It was an unhindered research institute. We wanted to be that. We wanted to be like the mad scientist, do whatever we want. Turns out you can't really do that, but we try. Um, so some seed funding from SRI, the Packard Foundation, thankfully was there for me and the Department of Surgery gave me some internal funding and we started fooling around a little bit with, with medical devices. We, in 2008, we established Mistral, which is multi, a uh, multidisciplinary initiative for surgical technology research. And I added the advanced laboratory because otherwise the acronym was MISTER, which I thought was less appealing. Um, here's the team right now and two of them are sitting right over there, this uh, Karen Shakespeare, uh, and Sarah Young, and there are engineering um, uh, fellows. They have engineering backgrounds, and this is Pablo right here, and uh, lots and lots of um, work going on. This is the process. All it's describing is we create working groups around medical device problems, um, and we iterate and iterate, and, uh, and the working groups will have engineers, they'll have uh, clinicians from Stanford mostly, but also elsewhere, and we'll have uh, other specialties, so for example, one of our working groups around catheter infections has an infectious diseases specialist from, St from Stanford University. Uh, we have business analysts, et cetera, whoever we need into the working group right from the very beginning. And that's when we, when we start that process of innovation. We work together, and once we get to a device project, we, get, we start looking at potential uh, exit strategies, uh, for, uh, particularly for commercialization, uh, and we um, you know, look at VCs, angels, etc. But the goal is to create, to get that thing commercialized and then take any equity from that and refeed it back into Mistral. So this is a not-for-profit type of concept uh, that hopefully will, will help um, support a lot of new device ideas. So as we were sort of developing the idea of Mistral, I started recognizing the prob problem of pediatric medical devices. So what's the problem? Well, there ain't a lot of kids out there, okay? And there's even fewer kids that are, that are sick and that need medical devices. So the VCs were not knocking down my door looking to give me money, okay? Because there isn't a huge market. We're still using a lot of archaic devices. This is one of the first devices I used as a, as a trainee in pediatric surgery. I know you're saying that looks like a grapefruit spoon, and it is a grapefruit spoon. And it's a grapefruit spoon with a little line uh, carved out of it. And what we used it for was hernia repairs to separate the hernia sac away from the other vital structures. Uh, but it's, it's a testament to, I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of elegant solution and cheap, right, which is nice. I mean, I think we should adhere to those principles, but it also kind of shows the type of uh, investment that's been in, in pediatric health care. You know, we have surgical robots for prostatectomies, but we got a spoon for the babies. Um, a lot of devices are used off-label. In other words, uh, they, were uh, they were not never designed for pediatric use, and we use them for pediatric use. Or we come up with our own solutions. This is one that was made in the, in the garage of a surgeon. Um, and we do have this culture of using adult devices on children, which is almost always the wrong thing to do because the devices are, are, are very big. But so the challenge then becomes, you know, how do we address these smaller niche markets? How do we make it uh, attractive for investors to, to get involved? Um, how do we get through those FDA barriers? There was no template to follow. Well, one of the first principles, I mean, when I started out on this, I was like Star Trek, right? I want to have the coolest uh, device and it's got to walk and talk and etc. And what I came to realize is the problem of medical devices is not a problem of extreme technology, it's a problem of extreme affordability. And what do I mean by that? And I'm going to tell you what this is. This thing is called, this is the Da Vinci robot. This is the, uh, the, um, the um, uh, surgical uh, robotic device that we use uh, uh, in many hospitals today. And this is something called Embrace. And Embrace was developed for, actually, I think it was India or Bangladesh. I can't remember which one. <clears throat> I think India. And, uh, and what it is is an infant warmer for premature babies. 
and it's sold throughout villages for a very, very affordable cost uh, to uh, people in these uh, third world nations who have premature babies who would otherwise require an incubator, but who's going to provide them with a $30,000 incubator? It's not going to happen. One of our docs, uh, Vinod Bhutani, was involved in the development of this, of this device. This is how we have to think in North America as well. I really believe that. I think we've got to stop thinking like, okay, let's make the next you know, uh, fighter jet that uh, equivalent of a surgical device, and let's make things that are affordable, that are cost conscious, but have high, high impact. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Fortunately, the FDA thought was thinking along the same lines, and, and uh, there was an act, uh, FDA Amendments Act in 2007, of which Title III uh, sought to improve the research, manufacture, and regulatory processes for pediatric medical devices and to help support the establishment of nonprofit consortia to stimulate development of pediatric devices. And uh, hey, that was kind of cool because I was like, hey, that's us. So we applied uh, to this grant that was uh, administered by the FDA to support these nonprofit consortia, and they had up two and a half million dollars <coughs> over two years to do this. And Mistral became, <coughs> excuse me, one of the one of the four grant recipients, we got a million dollars, 500,000 a year for two years, along with Michigan, UCSF, and Boston Children's. <clears throat> and so um, the objectives are to turn unmet needs into viable products by creating community of stakeholders with a pipeline of sustainable opportunities, and also um, to develop funding opportunities which address the clinical need, the business opportunity, and the technical approach. Uh, we're also seeking industry partners to help us commercialize some of these products. The goal here is sustainability. Get them out there, get them uh, so that people can use them. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can't do it at a loss, so you've got to figure out a way to make it so that you can keep this, uh, the pipeline of devices coming. And we have a whole bunch of different uh, 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 devices we've been working on, working on uh, with um, the uh, cardiac intensive care unit doctors at um, in, at Packard Hospital, working on clinical dashboards, large screens that show you data on the patients, and then take that data and do predictive analysis. So before there's a crash, in other words, before a patient has a cardiopulmonary arrest, uh, this, this uh, software will tell you that it's going to happen, and you can start doing things to prevent it in the first place. So predictive analysis. So technology includes information technology. Um, we have... Uh, here we have a device for doing um, that connection of the esophagus that I told you about. I'll show you a little picture of that. We're working on a device for something called pyloric stenosis. We're working with the gastroenterologists to work on uh, technologies for endoscopy uh, and working with uh, Rafael Guzman, who's a neurosurgeon, a pediatric neurosurgeon, and we're developing a device for him. What is he going to do with it? Well, here's a... Uh, I, I, I had to put the end of the device in here because I couldn't actually show it to you because of IP issues, so that's why this picture is not so revealing. But th what this is is, the, is a uh, model of a skull, and, uh, the, and, it, and we've created a model of the ventricles of the skull, of the brain, and this device basically makes a tiny incision. You go right into the ventricle, and it's got end effectors or little uh, graspers and things that let you do a tumor resection or a biopsy, et cetera. And when you take it out, you're just left with that tiny incision. And so that's what we're working on with Raphael. And we have a working prototype now, which is very exciting. Um, surgeons, many, most surgeons make an incision, take a piece of the skull off, spread the brain like this with the retractors, and do that operation. So this is going to be a really, really big hit if we can get it. To, uh, to work. This is the pyloromyotomy device, and this is the little anastomosis device I was talking to you about. So, but, you know, our work isn't done. I think uh, Mistral's still a work in progress, and I kind of look at it as Death Star. You guys recognize this? Yeah. Death Star, and it's, we're still building, and uh, we're trying to develop industry contacts and getting support from the medical device industry in this endeavor. Uh, but I am uh, certain, I'm certain that we're going to be successful. It's just a matter of time. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.